of income inequality, increasing density, um, costs of land going up. We've got a lot of people renting, uh, or this could be for either one, um, renting for investment and not living in places. Do you think there should be any sort of a tax or special use, uh, special re residency requirement to keep people from uh, maybe influencing another housing bubble by renting um, and not living in places, especially this is mostly a problem in New York, I guess. I'm wondering how you would you would implement something like that. Um, you'd have the residence police, so you got to you have to sign out to tell them that they're on vacation. <laughs> you know, um, this is just my feeling is that that the market tends to take care of things in, in many ways, not always, and we have to balance the market against general societal needs, but if someone has a building or say an apartment and they leave it vacant on a speculative basis that it will go up, um, when they could be renting it to someone else, generally the market will say that someone wants the money and they'll rent it out to someone else. I mean, that, that would be my belief. Um, I've certainly, north of us, in north of Seattle, we saw a speculative bubble as people um, emigrated from Hong Kong to Vancouver. And uh, that became quite a mess. Uh, but, but it took a while to build up. Um, I can't speak to New York City, but again, how you would implement such um, an ordinance would be Mm -hmm. uh, I think you'd get a bunch of civil rights suits mm -hmm. right off. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you could implement it in this country. Mm -hmm. So a, a problem worth addressing, but challenging implementation, at least in those of those kinds of. When you say worth addressing, it um, you know speculative bubbles have happened historically, probably for a couple thousand years, and um, you could say that you want to dampen a, a speculative bubble if that's what you're saying. Um, that is a political decision. And if it runs into uh, basic, let's say, constitutional rights, then you know, the society in general will, will suffer from creating its own bubble. Mm -hmm. okay. Sure. What do you think either of you is the most under-addressed issue in tall building design or development? And how would you address it? Something that's not being talked about or not being talked about at the highest levels or enough? I think our building tries to address it. But it's I'm, I'm not sure what the most under addressed. They're so complicated. Um, like on building from the structure, mechanical, electrical, everything about it. Um, I'm not sure what's not addressed. Um, you seem to be suggesting maybe it's sustainability? I wouldn't even say it's sustainability. I'd say, and, and again, this is my first high rise, I have to say that, um, is that uh, all of my career, um, we've tried to be, do buildings that were responsive to circumstance. When I say that, that is that there's an institution that you're going to house, you know, you're gonna create a shelter for an institution, whether it's a family or whether it's a repository of knowledge like a library or a place of faith like, or, or belief like a church, each institution has kind of an anatomy that wants to be examined. This one happens to be commerce. Whether it's a government building or not, it's commerce. So that's one thing you examine. And you also examine place. And then you also examine the materials. And when you get to that one of place, and this is again our first high rise, I looked at high rises and I go, well wait a second here. The sun comes up in the east and it sets in the west and it's highest in the south and it's lowest in the west and it's always warmest right before the sun sets, right? Because everything heats up. Why are all the, bil all the buildings I'm seeing all over the world the same on every side when, when circumstance would tell you that there are different environmental inputs on each side? So I would say what's not necessarily addressed, and this is gonna be a broad thing, is tangible reality over style. Hmm. And, and I wouldn't even say style over technology because obviously when you do something square or in many of the shapes we're seeing, um, they're driven by uh, structural forces, by wind loads. Uh, it was very interesting uh, wind loading uh, uh, 
uh, lecture we just heard. Um, there are lots of forces that drive things, but they're not necessarily tangible reality, other mm -hmm. than gravity, which obviously tall buildings have to respond to and is... And seismicity. Yeah, and, and obviously gravity is the most ubiquitous force in our daily lives, right? You're feeling it in your behind right now. <laughs> okay, so, um, so from that standpoint, um, uh, you know, expressing those forces, you know, that is not just making the building respond to gravity, but letting everybody understand those forces is, is valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's response to circumstance. The sun comes up in the west, sets in the, you know, comes up in the east, sets in the, in the west. That's a circumstance, particularly where buildings are driven by mechanical systems. I don't see that as much as I believe we should see. Are there buildings that either of you admire that do this or that, that do something um, innovative in tall building design that you think should be emulated further elsewhere? Just did it, and it, it reminded me when you talked about the east, west, south, uh, all being the same. We just did a courthouse in um, Salt Lake City that Tom Pfeiffer designed. Um, mm. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's aluminum extrusion that from a distance it, it looks the same. Um, but it has fins that face north or south, depending on the side, so that, so that uh, in a real micro is responding to and allows the direct sunlight when you want it and shades the glass when you don't want it. Um, and I haven't seen that before. I think it's a, a pretty unique um, application mm -hmm. that uh, I think we'll probably see more of. Do either of you think uh, wood will become a uh, uh, common material in tall building design within 10 years, and why or why not? I would hope so. I would hope so um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is it's something I know a lot about. Um, uh, the other, though, is you always have to remember that every pound or kilogram of wood sequesters 1.8 pounds of carbon dioxide. And it's a renew. It's basically uh, trees are basically solar energy. You know, it's a renewable resource, and um, and so that the energy that goes in to assembling, let's say, um, CLT cross laminated timbers. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. about those, but uh, it is considerably less than making concrete or steel. So, um, in terms of building a building out of renewable resources and um, sequestering carbon dioxide as opposed to creating carbon dioxide is, uh, is a pretty positive thing. I, I recently was, um, where was I? Uh, we uh, actually, one of the competitors in today's uh, thing, SOM, uh, their interiors department's working with me mm -hmm. on another project. And uh, I think that I think it's SOM that's looking at a composite concrete yeah, CLT building. Yeah, for a building here. Um, right. Mid-century. Yeah, it's, you know, they're working on it. I'm not sure. Yeah, it sounds like they're going to pull it off. Um, and, and that's it's pretty cool. You know, yeah. the fire issues seem to be taken care of. And um, I think it's pretty impressive. And from a standpoint of uh, us being sustainable on this planet, uh, I think you could, you could do a lot worse. <laughs> okay. uh, moving on to specifically the Edith Green Wendell Wyatt Federal Building here. Mm -hmm. um, so the facades, the shading on the facades is described as reed-like in the hand, handout that we're all getting today at the Council on Tall Buildings uh, Award Symposium. Um, does biology inform your design process? It's a long story. <laughs> it's a very, very long story. And um, yes, it does. And some of the early, I'll be showing some of the design development drawings that are just hand sketches of the building. And, and originally the building was intended to be a cyborg building. That is cyborg in the sense that uh, it was going to modulate its um, heating and cooling with living systems. That mm -hmm. is literally, it was going to be green from head to toe. They had designed it in massive planters all the way up the building. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we were going to use deciduous vegetation that would allow us to, uh, in the summer, let the building be fully shaded, and in the winter, let in some solar gain. And um, for multiple reasons, some highly technical and very valid, and others political. Um, it, uh, the, that, the plug was pulled on that idea very late in the game. 
And uh, when we went to design a new system for shading and reflecting, because we, you don't only shade a building, you want to bounce light into it to get maximum daylighting as far back into the spaces as possible. Um, I was working with uh, the lead designer at Benson Engineering. Benson Engineering is one of the th three really big, excellent curtain wall designers in the world, really. And um, uh, the lead designer and I were literally sitting at a table with about eight guys around us because the clock was ticking. They were starting construction. We didn't have a, a surface yet. And um, uh, he came up with ideas, I came up with ideas, and we kept working on stuff, and I kept on wanting to make it organic, like almost like leaves of a, or branches of a tree for shading. And then um, he kept reminding me about the, um, that it had to be reproducible and be able to be mass produced. So we had to come up with some modular way of doing it to, uh, to make sure that it could be completely built in the factory and just flown into place, literally with a crane, craned into place. And I think to placate me, he called them reeds. <laughs> these were these big aluminum bars, which originally were kind of more like pickup sticks. And then they got more and more realistic to the technology that we'd have to employ to, to build them and apply them to the building. So the term read stuck, but it was Jeremy, the lead designer at Benson's term that he used to make me feel a little bit better about losing my green building. You wanted the tree branch and you got a read. Yep, yep. Hmm. I don't know if I ever told you this, but when uh, on the Salt Lake City building that I just talked about, when I went to see the mock-up at Benson, uh -huh. um, I hadn't gone to see the mock-up for Edith Green, but they had the mock-up for Salt Lake City, the mock-up for the Edith Green building, and the mock-up for the World Trade Center all there at the same time. Yeah. It was pretty cool to yeah. see all three yeah, ben, uh, in one did, spot. Yeah, yeah, Benson did the World Trade Center. Right. And it was, you know, and again, this is, we have the smallest of the buildings and the finalists. Right. And, um, and it is a remodel, which is, makes it even stranger. Right. And it's, it's only 18 stories. And so it was wonderful to go to Benson Engineering, which really, they're, these are really professional, really good people. and. Um, and there is our, our mock-up of our wall with the reeds, all done in wood, actually, mm. as a, as a mock-up. And uh, there is this panel from the World Trade Center mm -hmm. being mocked up at the same time. Mm. It's pretty cool. Yeah, man. And out of Portland. Uh, all out of Portland, Oregon. Mm. Mm. There you go. Although, you know what? The stainless panels on the Freedom Tower, I think that's what it really is, um, they're manuf they were manufactured in Germany and shipped to Portland then assembled in Portland and then shipped back to New York. Huh. I no idea. Panels, yeah. I think we only have time for one more question. I wanted to ask about the GSA uh, has been very good about getting involved with deep energy retrofits and, and probably learning a lot of lessons for outmoded mid-century office buildings, how to make them energy efficient and not just a little bit, but usually achieving deep energy retrofits. Have you learned any um, lessons from having to do this sort of work that might apply to other people looking to update mid-century office buildings or buildings that are out of sure. date? Sure, I mean, every project we do, we try to learn, uh, you know, what lessons we're learning and, and moving that forward. Um, we sort of have to. I, we've got, uh, and it's in my presentation, over 60 million square feet of mid-century space um, to retrofit. So it's, uh, and what, 580 buildings um, that, you know, I think we've maybe only done 20 buildings that we've modernized um, over the past few years. So, so we've got to do that. Everyone's being a little different. I think you're going to learn different lessons on everyone. Sure, every every building has got to be its own thing. But is there anything that's been really surprising or, or interesting, in, in either in a specific case or throughout several? Um, well, probably Challenging. early on, uh, 10 years ago, we were retrofitting the uh, Byron Rogers building in Denver. and building wasn't 50 years old and ran up against uh, preservation issues. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, kind of had to step back and, and take another look at the project that, uh, you know, people came out of the woodwork and said, you know, I, I protested the Vietnam War in front of that building and, uh, you know, may not mean much to you, but uh, um, it's, and in Denver, that was the only uh, sort of mid-century mm -hmm. modern building in Denver. So, um, you know, we have to, look at the overall inventory.